In this video, we are going to revisit the example of the previous video, and we are going to implement a memory efficient solution. So let's go ahead and uh, create a new file. Let's call it MFR revisited. So the example is the same as in the previous video. So we are given a list of numbers, and we are going to use the same numbers that we always use in this course. So 7, 11, 8, 5, 3, 12, 2, 6, 9, 10, 1, and 4. So hopefully I didn't mess up the numbers because otherwise we will not get the same result of 292 as we did in the previous video. So let's see if I got it correct. So let's also briefly revisit the task. So the task is simply to first transform all the numbers and the transformation rule is simply going to be the new number is going to be the old number raised to the power of 2 plus 1. So I will write that using a mathematical notation. Y will be the new Y, the, the mapped number, will be x squared plus 1, the old number. Then we are going to filter out the odd ones. And last, we are going to um, sum up all the remaining numbers. So that is the task. So previously, we um, solved the task using a temporary list object or two temporary list objects. And in this uh, video, we are going to avoid that. We want to be memory efficient. So let's go ahead and see how Python can help us do that. So at first, we are still going to do the mapping step. And mapping step is all the operations um, in our calculation that take some number or some element in our original data set and map it to some other element. That is, of course, step number one in the task. So we are going to map every number to its square plus one. In order to do that, in this uh, video, we are going to define a helper function. Let's simply call it transform for now. The function takes one element as an argument. So let's say, simply say element as the argument. And now it is going to return the element raised to the power of 2 plus 1. And you will see in a bit why I'm, I have to define a function here. Okay, so that is the mapping step. So given some element, we just, raise it, we just square it and add 1. So now comes the big idea. Now we are going to use a built-in into Python called the map built-in. And the name map is, of course, derived from the mapping step, right? From the map filter reduce paradigm, there is the mapping step. And uh, in Python, there is a built-in function called map. And this function implements or helps us implement the mapping step in a memory efficient way. So let's do that. So what does the map function uh, do? So the map function takes as its input um, first a function. So maybe let's go to the Python documentation so that you can also uh, read that up simultaneously. So the map built-in is right here. And we see that the map built-in takes as its first argument a function. And then it takes further intervals. So one interval and then the dot 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 simply says um, there can be further arguments also going to be intervals. And we have seen uh, in a previous video of how we can implement a function ourselves that takes um, an, any number of arguments using the star notation for packing and unpacking, if you remember. But for now, we only have one iterable, which is our numbers list and one function. And the function that map takes is going to be a function that has to take one argument itself and it has to provide back the element that is uh, the thing that is being mapped to, okay? So what we are going to do is we are going to um, give the map built-in a reference to the transform function. So note how once the function is defined, I can simply reference the function by its name. Okay. So uh, transform is just a normal variable that I can refer that I can use to reference the function object. And now I'm going to pass a reference to the function object as the first argument to the map built-in. The second argument is going to be our numbers list. And now let's see what happens if I execute that. I get back a map at some memory address. Okay. So what can we do with that? So first of all. Let's go ahead and store that in a variable. Let's call it transformer. 
Okay, so there's a transform function and now there is a transformer. And the transformer is the thing that transforms the elements. That's why I call it transformer. So the type of transformer is going to be map. Okay, it's a map. So sometimes you hear programmers say that it's a map, um, you know, mapping elements from this set of things to this set of things. So, but map is a type, as we see. It's a type, a concrete data type built into Python. And now what can a map do? Well, now comes the thing. It can only do one thing. It can only, using the function next, the built-in function called next, it can give you the next element in line. So by saying next, and we give it transformer as the argument, I get the number 50. The number 50 happens to be seven to the power of two plus one. Okay, let's see if I execute next transformer a second time. Now I get back 122. That is simply 11 to the power of two plus one. Now I do it one more time, I get that 65 and you get the idea it's eight to the power of two, which is 64 plus one. So what is the map object? So there's another concept that I will talk extensively about in a future video. Um, which is called the iterator. So iterator is an abstract data type. And just like we saw before, a sequence is an abstract data type and a list is a concrete data type that implements the sequence uh, idea. The map data type is a concrete data type and it implements the idea behind an iterator. And an iterator, formally speaking, is any, ob is any object in Python that can do one thing and one thing only. It can provide you the, the next element in line. Okay, so in other words, the transformer object here, it cannot even go backwards, right? So if I go ahead and let's say there is no previous function, there's only a next function. And also if I go ahead and I ask Python, hey, what is the length of transformer? I will get an error message because the transformer object does not even know how long it is, okay? So it is not a sized object. You remember the term sized is also an abstract uh, property that sequences have, for example, but the transformer object is an iterator and iterators are not sized. So in other words, um, how I think of that, casually speaking, is transformer is really a rule in memory that knows how to calculate something, but has not yet calculated that. Okay, it's like a postponed calculation. It's like a rule. It's a a box in memory, an object in memory that models a rule how to calculate something without having it done yet. Okay, and how can we make the rule calculate the elements? Well, one way is the way that I just showed you um, by simply using the next function. The next function goes to the rule and says, hey rule, can you give me the next element that you can calculate? And it cannot, the rule cannot go backward, it can only go forward. Instead of using the um, next function, we could also go ahead and use the list constructor and I could give the list constructor the transformer object. And now I get back a list of all the transformed numbers. However, note one thing, this list is shorter than the numbers list. Why is it shorter? Well, let's see what is the first number we get here. The first number is the number 10. So how, why is the first number 10? Well, the last time I called the next function with transformer as the argument, I got back 26. So 26 is obviously um, the, the mapped object that is mapped to the number five because five to the power of two plus one is 26. So three squared plus one gives me 10, right? And 12 squared plus one gives me 145. So therefore the list constructor now, um, basically behind the scenes, we, we remember that the list constructor takes any iterable and, and an iterator is also an iterable. Um, that is al already uh, maybe a confusing thing that an iterator and an iterable, they are two different concepts, but we will talk about that in a future video in detail. So for now, let's simply uh, view it this way. The next function will simply get, get us the next object and the list constructor will simply go ahead and call next, 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 as long as there is no next, okay? So the list constructor is like, maybe let's write it down, automating next, okay? It automatically um, calls next as often as until there is, until the end is uh, reached, right? And the, the object itself, as we just saw, does not even know when the end is. 
So the only thing the transform object knows is, well, hey, I don't have any more, any more element to give you. So let's go ahead and see what would happen now if we went ahead and we called next on transformer again. Now I get a so-called stop iteration exception. So I get a red error message. And this error message is really not an error. This is just a signal from Python to you that the iterator, so the transformer object, is now out of elements. So now, from now on, as long as I call that, I get back nothing. And let's say, one more thing, if I go ahead and call the list constructor one more time with transformer as the object, I simply get back an empty list because the transformer object does not know how to produce anything anymore. Okay, so what can we do now with transformer? Well, with the transformer object, you cannot do anything anymore. It is basically exhausted. That's the technical term, it is exhausted. Cannot do anything anymore. So let's remove all these cells um, again. And let's create a new, a new transform object by calling the built-in map function one more time. And this basically gives us a new transformer. And now if I call next again, I will get the first, um, the first mapped element. Okay. However, I don't want to do that now. I want to postpone that. That's the whole idea of being memory efficient. I want to postpone all the calculations until I really have to do them. So let's continue with the second step the filtering step. And the filtering step, for that I will also write a function. And I will call the function, let's say, if even. And the function also takes one element as its argument. And now it is going to do the following. It will check if element modulo divided by two is zero, then the function is going to return true otherwise, so else, the function is going to return false. Okay, so this function is given an element, any num a number here, and it tells me yes or no if the number is even or not. So now let's make this function a bit shorter. So the, the first way to make it shorter is get rid of the else clause and unindent the return false. This is called the early exit pattern. And now there's even a nicer way to do that. So note how this function gives us back either true or false, one of the two. So this um, expression here, the condition element divided by two double equals zero itself also evaluates into either true or false. We can try that out by simply going ahead and say, let's say if I had two modulo divided by two double equals zero, I get back a true. If I divide three by two, I get back a false. So we see that the condition itself generates already booleans. And this is going to be true when the number is even. So in other words, what I could do, I could get back of I could get rid of both the return statements here. I can get rid of the if clause, the if statement, and I can simply return the result of this expression. That's it. Okay? The result, this is going to be return either true or false, and true indicates the number is even. So that is our is even function. And now Similarly to how we use the map built-in, we're now going to use an, a built-in that is um, called the filter built-in right here. And the filter built-in also takes a function and one iterable as an argument. And basically how this works is as follows. If I go ahead and I create a filter and I give it as its function, the if even function, and I, let's say I for now give it the numbers list, I get back a filter object. So what is a filter object? So filter, let's um, maybe, um, what is a good name for that? So um, let's simply call it evens. So evens is now not a list, but evens is now of type filter. So filter is another concrete data type that abstractly speaking is also an iterator. Okay, so what do the map and the filter data types have in common? Well, they have in common that they only are good for one operation, getting the next element in line. So if I now go ahead and say next filter, uh, not, not next filter, but next event, of course, I get back the number eight. Why the number eight? Well, if we go through this list here, the original list of numbers, it says seven, 11, they are both odd, and eight is the first even number. So next events gives me um, eight. 
So what would be the next number it would give me back? It would be the number 12, obviously. So let's try if it works. And indeed it does. So the uh, filter object is good for one thing. It will give us, the according to some rule in memory, it will, us get, uh, it will give us back the next element in line. And the rule is going to be the next element must be even. That's it. So now if I go ahead and uh, execute this cell a couple of times, I get back all the even numbers, one by one. And uh, at some point I get a stop iteration exception because the evens iterator is uh, exhausted. Okay, so same idea as above. So now we are going to do uh, one thing different here. Instead of, uh, instead of um, drawing um, the numbers from the numbers list, what we are going to do is, we are going to draw the numbers from the transformer object. Okay, so note how here I created, um, let's do it uh, over again so that we can be sure that the object is fresh. It is, it is not exhausted, not used so far. The transformer object is now only a rule in memory that knows how to calculate something, okay? And the rule is simply take some number from numbers and transform it to this according to this rule and give me the next number according to this rule. Now the filter um, object down here as its source, so to say, is not using the numbers list, but the transformer. So we are building a rule that as a source has another rule. So in other words, we are going to ask the filter object, hey, give me your next thing. And the filter object says, well, I'm going to ask the transformer object to give me the next thing. And then the transformer object goes into the numbers list and the numbers list will, us give, will give us the next number. And then the number first goes through the transformer to be transformed. And then the transformed number is going to be filtered right after each other, okay? So in other words, if I now go ahead and I say next events, I am not going to get the number eight anymore, but I'm possibly getting the number seven squared plus one, which is 50. So let's see that. And indeed I get back the number 50, okay? So I'm doing one by one calculation, so to say. Okay, this is like um, some people call that a pipeline. So whenever I enter um, or whenever I execute this cell here, next events, the, the filter object is going to get its next number and it's going to ask transformer and transformer is going to ask for it, its next number, which gets the next number from numbers. So we are pulling out, in other words, we are pulling out the numbers one by one. We are transforming them, filtering them, and then we have to do something else with them. Okay. And the something else we want to do with them is the following. This is the easiest part in the whole chain here. So let's get rid of the next here. The easiest part in the whole chain is simply the reduction step as before. So this is not no different from before. And the reduction step, we can simply use the sum function. So the sum function, um, according to the documentation, takes, as we see, any iterable, anything we can loop over. And now we are going to loop over the events object and even is a filter object, right? So now this is giving me the same answer as in the previous video, luckily, so the numbers above are correct, 292. However, we are doing that in a memory efficient way. Okay, so let's quickly go ahead and um, copy paste that over to Python Tutor so that we see the difference also in a memory diagram. So here are the numbers. Now I have to copy paste a little bit more and in the next video, we are going to see how we can even get rid of the, the functions that I now need to copy paste. So let's go ahead and copy paste over this here. Let's also copy paste over the filter function and let's maybe put the, the functions on top. So the filter function goes on top here. Then we create the events um, object. And then last but not least, we are calculating the, the result as the sum of events. Okay, so let's go ahead and visualize that. So first we are going to create the numbers list in the global scope that is exactly the same as before. And we must do that because somehow we have to uh, be given some raw data. Now we are going to create two objects which um, model the rules. They are just a plain ordinary function objects, nothing special about them. And when it comes to memory consumption, we can assume that they are not consuming a lot of memory. 
Okay, so we only care about the big list that possibly has, I don't know, 10 billion numbers in it, but we don't really care about the size of the function objects here. Now next we get a transformer object, which is, um, it says here a map instance. So it's a, an object of type map, which is simply a rule that uses uh, the functions above to pull out numbers one by one. Then we create the events filter object. And last but not least, we are going to run all of them through the uh, into or putting all of them into the uh, sum um, built in. And this is simply going to uh, calculate as we see on a one by one, uh, this is actually a very nice um, visualization. So now we are going to run the sum function and the sum function first calls the transform function with an element of seven. So the first number, this is going to return 50, which is a square plus one. Now the is even function is given the number 50 and it's going to return true because the number 50 is even. And now uh, we go over all the numbers one by one as we see. So it's a couple of steps I have to click through. I will make that a bit faster, but we see that there is no second list object or no third list object. So all the numbers are processed one by one. And what the sum function does is the sum function internally works just like the very first Python example in this course. It's, it's basically ru uh, calculating a uh, running total, okay? That is usually how a pro uh, programmer um, does um, addition for more than two numbers by doing a running total. And at the end, we see a result of 292 and there is no other list object. And again, those function object and map and filter objects here, we can disregard them. They don't really have a, you know, they don't really have big uh, memory consumption. Okay, so that is the first step that uh, you have to get used to if you want to work with big amounts of data using um, objects that model rules that know how to calculate the next object in line without having it, uh, without calculating it yet. And then in this uh, case, the, re the, the reduction step is the thing that drives all the elements. The reduction step is the thing that um, makes the rules um, materialize into real numbers, but we're doing that on a one by one basis. And then the, in this case, the sum function simply takes the transformed and filtered numbers on a one by one basis and simply adds them on top of a running total and then uh, calculates the result. So super memory efficient, okay? So I know that um, for a beginner, this may be a bit hard to swallow, but I think it's not too hard. I would suggest compare it with the previous video again to see the differences in memory. We don't have a, a second list here as we see. And in the next video, we are going to talk about the same example one more time, and we are going to make it um, even more concise by uh, getting rid of um, the function objects that we have to define here. Okay, so I will see you in the next video.